This is Chapter 5, The Enlightenment in Revolution, Discussion Number 2, Salons and the Enlightened Despots. A lot of those Enlightenment ideas were debated, cultivated, and started to find their shape in the Salons of Europe. Now, when I say salons, I know a lot of you are thinking uh, perms, hair getting colored, manicure, pedicure. That's not what we're talking about here when we're talking about salons. Salons refer to uh, a room in a lot of these large, uh, rich people's homes where they would gather friends and spend an evening discussing uh, various topics, literature, politics, philosophies, and they kind of turned into intellectual discussion clubs. Uh, some of the some people were extremely famous for having uh, some intellectual discussion clubs that everyone wanted to be invited to uh, because they were the it thing to do. Now, while absolute monarchs would despise and protect themselves by not wanting these new ideas coming out because a lot of these new ideas threatened their position of being a uh, absolute ruler of a country. And as people were fomenting these new ideas, these new ideas would essentially say that the people can make the decisions, that the people can make responsible um, results from what they were trying to do. And the absolute monarchs were like, well, wait a minute, I'm the one who's supposed to be making all the decisions. And it began to get out of their control. One of the ideas that a lot of these monarchs did was establishing ideas of censorship. That essentially, if these things are written down and by some of the philosophers that we heard about in the first section, that they, books would be demanded to be burned. You weren't allowed having them. They be, Some of them became illegal. Uh, but the monarchs were essentially saying that you need to listen to me, not come up with these all these newfangled ideas. Of course, the church jo um, joined in on this idea because... When everyone started discussing and and writing down what they considered to be these social natural laws, and the way that, you know, hey, stealing doesn't work, not just because God says no, but because people in their private property ought to be able to have control over what they have accumulated with their wealth. And simply to take it means that our society cannot exist in the impetus or the uh, encouragement to go out and get your own stuff by hard work is going to be destroyed if we just say steal whatever you want to. And it's kind of backwards here because God created those laws uh, and those laws exist within the natural fabric of society because God put them there and then he codified them and put them in writing by giving us the Ten Commandments. So it's not that the natural laws exist, uh, but is that God created them and that they are there. Uh, but the church didn't like it because people were going, well, the natural laws are explanation of what we need to know and not know. And then people stopped listening to the church of what to do or ought not to do. So, But there were some rulers during this time period that wanted to give their people some more freedoms, mainly because uh, they realized that if they tried to squelch everyone down, they might be revolted against to the point that they might be kicked out of their positions. And so they would give their ruling, or the people that they ruled, some freedoms so that they wouldn't, like, overthrow them. For example, Frederick the Great of Prussia allowed the freedom of the press and tolerated religious differences. Uh, in fact, he never really called himself the King of Prussia or the Emperor of Prussia, even though he was, and a lot sometimes he did, but he also had the, called himself the title the First Servant of the State, that it was his role in order to make sure that the state ran well and that it worked well for the people, not just for himself. Catherine the Great of Russia uh, granted uh, the nobles the Charter of Rights, saying that this is what you are allowed to do and not allowed to do. She also wasn't completely thrilled with the idea of serfdom and encouraged that serfdom should be a thing of the past. Uh, remember, serfdom is just above slavery as far as what you'd rather be. Because slavery, your person and everything about you was owned. Serfdom, you, you had, I mean, it wasn't like the Lord could kill you if they wanted to, but they owned your work. Uh, also, Catherine the Great said, no more torture, period. Another guy is Joseph II of Austria. He supported religious equality for the Jews. At this point, the Jews are a favorite group to pick on. They're different than everyone else. Uh, there's still this idea that came through the Middle Ages that the Jews were the ones who killed Jesus and therefore they're evil. Um, 
Of course, remember that Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do, but that kind of got glossed over by all the people who wanted to have someone to beat up on uh, and to blame for uh, Jesus Christ's crucifixion, and they didn't want to blame themselves because they had sinned. Um, also allowed a free press and said, no more censorship, print what you want. Uh, essentially, a lot of these people had the idea that, hey, you can have a free pr free press, and but I'm but people are going to be so appreciative of what I do for them that they're not going to revolt against what I'm talking about. Also, got to rid a lot of the royal monasteries to support medical missions. And so that also helped a lot of people look favorably on what they were doing. Now, each of these despots, and there were other ones, but they were still autocratic dictators. Uh, but they were trying to essentially say that we are, like Frederick, Frederick said of Prussia, we are here to make everyone's life better, and by our superior rule, we can maintain our position in society, but we can make other people's life better. And so a lot of times they were they being called the benevolent dictators. This concludes discussion number two, the Salons and Enlightened Despots, as of chapter five, the Enlightenment and Revolution.